your attention, if I get your attention again. Okay. All right, so where were we? We were here. We were talking about the three classes of reasons that people gave for why they conformed in the Ash Conformity Experiment. And here's some more details about the results of that experiment. Uh, one interesting detail, I think, I think this is kind of interesting. They found, they done studies where they had uh, different numbers of people that were Confederates in the study. So in the study I guess we're going to do, there's eight, right? Uh, but they did different studies where there's one, or two, or three, or seven, or ten, or whatever. And what they found was that once you get to three, you get the same level of conformity you'll get after that, at least in this setting. I mean, that doesn't mean that that's always true or some rule for life that three people pressure you as much as, you know, a hundred would. I doubt that's the case. But what they found was, yeah, the conformity levels leveled off at three or more, um, which is, you know, kind of interesting. And that makes sense. I think if, you know, it's one person, and you're like, well, shit, we just disagree about this. Uh, if it's two people, you know, it's not so hard to stand up. And I do agree that something about three, you kind of feel like you're up against a group, you know? I don't know. I feel like that's, I don't know. Um, also, they found one dissenter. If you put in one dissenter in the group, so like maybe seven people say the wrong answer, but then the dissenter says, uh, you know, obviously, you know, line one is the right answer, uh, that was enough to essentially eliminate the effect entirely. So if you could just get a little bit of credibility to disagree with the group norm, then people don't agree with the group norm. So um, that obviously would not be the case in like a Sharif setting where it's highly ambiguous, uh, but it's the case in the ass setting where you know the right answer, you want to give the right answer at some level probably, but you don't because of conformity pressure. Yes, yeah, the question was, uh, and you got that from the ash reading? From the, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the question was, didn't they find that people, if they had already been conforming on some trials and halfway through the experiment, they essentially introduced a dissenter, or have one of the Confederates start dissenting on the critical trials, that the person kept conforming anyway due to possibly cognitive dissonance? Didn't they find that? I have no idea, but that's very interesting. And uh, I'll go reread the paper, because that sounds cool. Um, that would be totally interesting. And it's actually kind of similar to an experiment that I ran, um, which we'll talk about uh, next week. So, um, good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Okay, uh, Stanley Milgram, the obedience experiment guy, the guy who studied obedience with Ori with the shocking stuff, the guy who we watched the replication of his, uh, of his research uh, for on Thursday. Stanley Milgram, for his dissertation, which he did in like 27 or something like that, uh, he replicated the Ash study uh, in two different countries, in Norway and France. And he was interested in how, uh, what they used to call culture in those days, national character. Um, which is kind of weird, we don't say that anymore, because uh, it sounds like maybe genetic or something to us. Um, and uh, we now we say culture for all that stuff. And what he did was, yeah, he replicated the Ash experiment in Norway and in France. Uh, some of you here are Norwegian, might find this interesting. What he found was that the Norwegians exhibited a similar level of conformity to the Americans, and the French exhibited far lower levels of conformity than Americans. And that kind of fits with some stereotype of French people is uh, willing to disagree, uh, very willing to disagree. My, my close French friends have exhibited that. Um, so, uh, but as you know, that's great, right? I mean, you know, conformity in the Ash setting is not exactly honorable. Uh, some other replications, some other studies that were conducted of the, uh, of the Ash setting, um, of the Ash study in other settings or under different conditions. Heron and Spencer uh, failed to replicate the Ash uh, study findings. They couldn't get eight Confederates to pressure a single subject in 1980 to fall in line with the group judgment. They concluded that the Ash effect was a child of its time. That it was something you could find in the 1950s when everybody was really conformist, but you couldn't find it now in the 1980s when people, you know, weren't conformist anymore. Uh, so that was their conclusion. Having lived in the 80s, I'm not sure I agree with their description of our respective times. But anyway, uh, but that's this idea. The 1950s U.S. was super conformist, so maybe the Ash study was an artifact of that. Further, uh, American college scene, the American college scene in the 1950s was very homogenous. Uh, Notice that all the subjects in that study were white males. That partly because that was mostly college students in those days were white males. So very homogenous white males from middle, maybe upper class backgrounds, or maybe. Yeah, upper middle, upper, upper class background, very homogenous, very tending towards conformity in these settings. Okay, Nicholson and Rockland, 1985, replicated in the U.S. and the U.K., uh, did find the relatively high level of conformity, but lower than the original. So this is kind of evidence that, yes, the dynamics of the Ash experiment are still true, but they're somewhat less. Uh, La Lancet and Sandy in 1990 failed to replicate the Ash finding of conformity on these standard trials. Perrin and Spencer, already told you that, don't know why I wrote that twice. Uh, Neo, 1995, replicated via computer in Portugal and did pretty well. Uh, so in a computer media setting where you don't even, you're not even giving your opinion, you know, in the presence of others, people still conformed at close to the same rate as people did in the original Ash setting. That was in Portugal, though, not here. Um, and actually, I ran a study, which we'll talk about next week, a couple years ago, where I, it wasn't exactly the Ash setting, it was conformity on a, a wine tasting, you know, in a wine tasting setting, and I found, you know, relatively high levels of conformity, but you can't really directly compare it to the Ash setting. So if the question is, do we still conform to the extent that Ash found in 1951, uh, or in his replications throughout the 50s of his study, uh, if that's the question, I'd say the answer is, we conform still, but maybe less. Cultural shifts have led us to conform to a less extreme extent, but we still do uh, conform a lot. Okay. So this brings us to a really, really important distinction that is one of the great ideas from the class, I think. Um, because I think it really, really clarifies your understanding of how other people influence your opinion, uh, your spoken opinion, your private opinions, and it really is the best idea, I would say, in the history of conformity research. The Ash study, the Sharif study are great demonstrations of the extent of conformity, especially the Ash study, right? You know, where people are conforming something they know isn't true or should know is not true. This is an idea, and an idea that really clarifies the way we think about these things. Okay, and the idea is from Deutsche Gerard, 1985, which you all read, so it's all redundant. Um, and the idea is that there's two forms of conformity, normative influence and informational influence. Chris, this is what you want this is what you got. Normative and informational influence. Normative influence is conformity to the views or expectations of others in pursuit of social approval or avoidance of disapproval. So this is when you conform because you want to not be embarrassed, you want to not be sanctioned, you want to not be privately judged or perceived as an idiot uh, in other people's eyes. Uh, which study does that correspond to? Which study is the best example of normative influence? Ash study, right? They know the right answer, but they conform anyway. Why do they do this? Presumably they don't look like morons in front of these people. Not because they really know the right answer. Or they, they think they think the group knows the right answer, they don't think that. Um, the other kind of influence is informational influence, where you use other people's behavior or attitudes as information or evidence about reality. You don't know the right answer, you rely on other people to try and get the right answer. You're not trying to seek approval or avoid embarrassment or not be sanctioned or privately judged. That's not the reason. Instead, you don't know the right answer, you're trying to get the right answer, and so you rely on the group. So here's some examples of this distinction. Uh, oh, I should say, which study corresponds to informational influence? Sure, right. You have no clue. Once a red dot move, you rely on these other people to try to get the right answer. Okay, so some examples of this distinction. Is I useless to use this thing again? No, no. All right, so. Um, uh, aha. Okay, so uh, you don't know what class you should take, so you get your friends advice about what class you should take. Uh, what kind of influence is that? Informational, exactly. Uh, I can't imagine what a normative equivalent that would be. Maybe like 10 of your friends all bully you into taking Geology 101 or something. Uh, okay, your friends pressure you to do something. Uh, this is purely hypothetical. I'm sure this never happened to you. Uh, your friends pressure you to doing something you know is risky and dumb. What
Exactly. You even know these people who made these ratings online, right? And so, you know, how could they normally influence you? You'll never see them again. They'll never know what restaurant you went to, and so on. They actually have this funny story, or this uh, economist uses this example when they talk about informational influence, uh, where they say you open a new restaurant, two new restaurants in New York City, right? Two new restaurants open up. They're next door to one another. The first person doesn't. They walks out to them and wants to go, you know, to dinner. They, they don't know which one is better. They have no clue which one's better, so they just randomly choose to go to say this restaurant, right? Then the next person comes along. They also have no clue which restaurant is better. So what do they do? They go to the restaurant that has one person in it and don't go to the one with zero people. And then the next person's like, oh, well, two people like this restaurant to go here, and everybody goes one with no people in it. That one must suck. And then eventually, this restaurant has, you know, dozens of people in it. You know, turn the profit, survive. This one goes under in a week, and it was just an artifact, just a random initial decision. Okay. Um, that's cute. Okay, so another one, you go to a bar that you don't have to go to bars, but where you hypothetically go to bars, you could go to one that you hate, and I assume you have one in mind now, uh, because all your friends want to go, you don't want to go, you don't change your mind, what kind of influence is that? Exactly, okay. Okay, so Deutsch and Gerard in their paper, in their paper identify a variety of factors that contribute to normative and informational influence, including the following, following observations. Uh, first, groups create more normative influence than a bunch of individuals. Uh, so when you take, if you were to be, um, if you were to somehow be exposed to a bunch of individuals uh, individually, they would exert some normative influence on you, but there's something different about when it all comes together in a group. So if, you know, say you call all your friends, you're like, what bar are we going to tonight? You know, then, what, again, and, uh, you, you call them all, and they're all like, oh, we're totally going to, I don't know, this, the Bears Lair, the, well, I don't know, this, it's some tiki lounge in Alameda, we'll say that. And you're like, oh, I don't want to go to the tiki lounge in Alameda, you know, why, why, you know, why are we always going to the tiki lounge in Alameda? And, and you're, you know, it's not that hard to tell one person that, right? Um, and so you tell each person this, and it's not so hard to resist normative influence. But imagine you're in a setting with eight people. Right, and they're like, we're totally going to that badass ski lounge in Alameda. You're like, awesome. You know, I can't wait to go. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna get one of those coconut drinks. It's gonna be wonderful. Um, okay. Another situation, when your view will be anonymous, there's less normative influence. That's like so obvious, I'm not going to go into it. Um, if your view was anonymous in the Ash setting, you wouldn't be influenced because no one would even know what your opinion was. Okay, so I don't know why I wish you'd probably point out. Uh, but if your view was anonymous, if you're, if you're submitting your view anonymously, uh, there would be, um, uh, that would not reduce informational influence, right? Does this make sense? So, for example, the Yelp.com example, right? You're trying to find the right restaurants. The only kind of influence going on is informational influence. You, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if these people don't know what restaurant you go to, right? Because it's informational influence. You're trying to get information from the group. Or in the Sharif setting, you are in a group, you assimilate to the group, then you split up into individuals and you keep saying what the group said, right? That's what we found. The group, 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 individual condition. People keep saying what the group said. Why? Even though the view is anonymous, they're not. It's not Influence, it's informational influence. Can somebody make that man up who fell asleep last Tuesday? Yes. You're missing college, sir. Okay. All right. Uncertainty uh, increases normative and informational influence. Uh, now, this is interesting. You know, we would understand why uncertainty would increase informational influence. Uncertainty increases informational influence because you don't know the right answer, right? So that makes perfect sense. And that's what Sharif was trying to capture. And that's what Ash was trying to eliminate. He was trying to create a situation that's not uncertain at all. Now, why would uncertainty uh, increase your normative influence, or your, you know, your willingness to be normatively influenced? Well, I think the reason is that your normative influence is a function in part of how strongly you believe your own private belief, right? So if people call you up and they're like, let's go to that tiki bar in Alameda, and you've never been there before, you don't have a strong opinion about it, it's an uncertain quantity to you, you just know it sounds ridiculous, uh, you know, you'll know, you be more likely to go than if you've gone 10 times have a very strong opinion about the tiki lounge, and you're like, no, I'm totally not going. So uncertainty increases both normative and informational influence, though perhaps for somewhat different reasons. Uh, no, it, it can increase normative influence because it undermines your conviction, it increases informational influence because it means you just don't know the right answer. Uh, or sorry, it increases on your minds. Uh, also, other people's uncertainty will decrease their normative influence over you. If people call you up or, or pressure you in a group, they're like, oh, maybe we should go to the Tiki Lounge because that would be awesome. Then that's going to have less influence on you than if they say so, certainly, right? And if the eight Confederates in the Ash setting had said, oh, I think maybe it's number three, but I'm not so sure, I bet conformity rates would be pretty low. Okay, so what are some other factors that affect normative influence? Group size, right? Ash showed that, right? Three people or more, that's a lot of influence. One or two people uh, trying to pressure you to say the wrong thing, not much influence. Uh, group unanimity. Uh, so when everybody's saying it, that's more uh, stronger, stronger form of pressure than when everybody but one. Remember, the lone dissenter essentially killed this effect in the Ash study. So group size, bigger size influence, uh, bigger groups influence you more, more unanimity influences you more. Also, when a group has a great deal of solidarity or cohesion, like maybe uh, certain kinds of churches do, uh, or the military, they can exert more normative influence. Why? Probably because you care more about judgments of you in other people's eyes. When people are judging you, you really want them to think well of you because you feel great investment in this group. Along the same lines, an individual's degree of identification with the group should also increase conformity because you value these group members. You really want them to accept you and judge you positively, so you fall in line with their attitudes. Uh, also, the status of uh, your status relative to other group members can affect how much normative influence can affect your view, right? So you can imagine uh, in certain settings where you're the least respected person, you feel this greater pressure to go along with the group. But in other settings where you're the most respected person, you might not only not go along with the group, but you might be the person that decides what they think. And then also investment or commitment to the group. And here I'm thinking of like when prophecy fails a little bit, right? These people who dumped all their possessions and dove into the group head first and were totally invested and committed to the group had no way out. They really didn't have any choice but be normally influenced um, when Mrs. Keach told them that they had saved everybody from the flood. So what factors affect informational influence? Well, some of the same factors, but some different ones as well. Perceived intelligence or confidence of other people relative to you, right? When you think they're really smart, then you're like, oh, they may be the right answer. Very simple. Uh, also, the number of others. You know, this many people can't be wrong about this restaurant, right? If you see uh, ratings of the honesty of somebody on eBay and there's 500 ratings, you'll weight that more heavily than if there's you know, two ratings, right? The number of others gives you more information or gives you more reliable information. Also, unanimity, right? When everybody went to that Thai restaurant and said it's badass, and literally everybody, then you think, oh, well, that's good, okay? But if, like, you know, half the people did, then not so much. Uh, and then, of course, your own uncertainty, which we already talked about in the Sharif study. You're extremely uncertain. You're very easily influenced at an informational level. And if you're thinking like me, you're thinking a little bit about balance theory right now, right? Because we talked about here, you're more influenced when you like the group, identify the group members, uh, and you're invested or committed to the group. That kind of reminds me of balance theory, right? Where you have this positive tie to the group or the group members, and that leads you to be more likely to assimilate to their view towards something, right? Um, like you like, uh, your date likes you, you like Kung Fu Panda, so she or he is likely to fall in line with your view of Kung Fu Panda. This is a picture of a large group of people. That's what conformity looks like. I don't know why I put this here. Whatever. Okay, that's just, yeah. Okay. So, so conformity quotes are a few, so don't pack up. Uh, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it is conformity, Rollo May. The reward for conformity is that everyone likes you but yourself, Rhea May Brown. I'm